All right, sophomores, welcome back. It's time to explore, continue exploring surrealism after World War II. And, and so I think the best way to kind of walk through this uh, little excerpt through uh, of post-World War II surrealism is to do these delightful little beams that I found some time ago. So, of course, we start off with good old Schoenberg. There he is. And, of course, composers have been working with tonality for centuries at this point. And Schoenberg comes up with the idea of serialism, which is to say the rope. And we studied that in our previous discussion as we did our 12-tone pitches in a particular row. We did the inversion of that. We did the retrograde of that. And we did the retrograde of the inversion and saw how Schoenberg used that in some of his 12-tone music. Well, this continues nicely. Schoenberg, of course, writes his first 12-tone piece between 1921 and 1923. And after World War II, 1947, it is going to be the next moment that we continue on and look at things with. And so, oh, hey, here's Babbitt. And Babbitt is going to expand upon Schoenberg's concept of, of 12-tone serialism by totalizing seri seriality with com by a combinatoriality. And what this means, let's go ahead and go to the whiteboard here and, and put up a little bit of a demonstration of what, what we're going to look at here. And so Babbitt, you know, con constructs the 12-tone the matrix and he has his, you know, he's got his... Get our whiteboard marker here. There we go. Of course, we've got our P form and we've got the retrograde form and we've got the inversion and we've got the, let's see if we can move these over, actually. Looking at my recording monitor, I see that I'm just about to start writing over my own head. So we'll move over on the right whiteboard just a little bit to halfway of the screen. So we've got our P form, our inversion, our retrograde, our retrograde of the inversion. And Babbitt combines these, so he's going to serialize dynamics and rhythms as well. And so for the dynamics, he just assigns if we're in the loud section of the piece, all of the P forms are going to be played at mezzo piano. If we're in the retrograde of the piece, everything is going to be a nice mezzo forte. All of the I forms are going to be a forte, and all of the RI forms are going to be a piano here in the louder section of the piece. So ranging from mezzo piano to forte, and the different piano to forte with two mezzos. In the softer section of the piece, uh, P form is going to get, it's going to be played at pianissimo. The retrograde is going to be played at piano. Our inversion is going to be played at mezzo piano. And our retrograde inversion is going to be played at pianissimo. So you can see that the inversion is always going to be the loudest thing that we hear at any given time. The retrograde of the inversion is going to be the softest things that we hear. And then the retrograde a little bit louder than the prime form. Of, of the row. And so he's assigned dynamics to each of the row forms. The other thing that he does is he's going to serialize um, durations of rhythms. And so what he decides to do is we're going to work with that 12 because there are 12 half steps, of course, in, in the chromatic scale. And he divides that up into 5, 1, four, and two. And if you do five plus one plus four plus two, it adds up to 12. And of course, we can do the inversion of this by just subtracting each of these from six. And so another order, five, one, four, two is one order, or I could do one, five, two, four. And he uses these as groups of notes. So he'll do a group of five, a group of one, a group of four, a group of two a group of one, a group of five, a group of two, a group of four. As we can see, if we just window over to the little excerpt that I put in here, this is his three compositions for piano. And so you can see, as, as we're talking about those groups of five, one, one, five, two, and four, here you go, one, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, one, two. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one. And in the bottom, one, two, three, four, one, two, 
one, two, three, four, five, one, 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 two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, four. And so those those rhythmic groupings are serialized as well. And and you can tell this is the nice thing about tone counting in Babbitt is we're here we're in a soft section here, and so we can already see that you know here's our pianissimo, and so this is a prime form of the row one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve different pitches here and the pianissimo indicates of course our retrograde of the inversion there are 12 pitches retrograde inversion goes up top and it's being accompanied here with the inversion with with one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve pitches and this excerpt you can listen to the full recording go look it up on youtube but this excerpt sounds like this Yeah, so there's Babbitt, three compositions for piano number one. Going back to Babbitt, of course, uh, the tonaliza totalization of seriality via combinatoriality. So he's combining these things, of, of course, to get uh, not just serialized pitches, but serialized dynamics and serialized rhythms as well. Fast forward a couple of years, 1949 into 1950, Messian comes on the scene. And now we're going to serialize all the things. All the things. So we're going to have pitches, and, and in his mode de valeur et d'intensité, I probably butcher that because I don't speak French, but it's from his four rhythmic etudes. And taking a look at some excerpts from the frontispiece for this piece, duck down under here. There we go. Look up at that. So you can see that he's doing a mode of, uh, of different tones, notes, and valeurs, uh, values, which is to say durations, attacks, articulations, and intensities, the different dynamics. And so you can see he has assigned the numbers 1 through 11. He's got 12 different dynamics, and he'll line them up with the, different, with the 12 different pitches, of course, in, in the matrix. Seven different dynamic levels that he'll serialize uh, tones. He says, you know, we're doing 12 tones, and so you can do those and different things. There's our divisions uh, of the note values, and so you can see he's come up with 24 different durations that are different combinations of 30-second notes there. So one 30-second note is 16th is two 30-seconds, a dot of 16th is three, eighth note is four, and so on and so forth. And so you come up with a total of 24 different versions there. And then there's his voicings of the different modes. So you can see the different pitches. You can see he's got a high register, a medium register, and a low register on the piano. And he's assigned dynamic levels to each of those uh, um, versions. Again, I recommend that you go listen to this piece. Messian, Modes de Valeurs et Intensités on YouTube. So back to Messian here. There we are. So we realize all the things, but only once. Uh, his pupil Boulez, Pierre Boulez, doubles down on that in 1952 with his structures one structures for two pianos, 1A. And here we go. Serialize all the things through all possible permutations, achieving total systematization of materials. Go listen to this. It sounds like random computer noises, honestly, to, to my ear. But where he constructs a matrix, and not the standard matrix where we do the prime form across the top and the inversion down the left and then so on and so forth. Instead, he constructs all different prime forms rotating to start on the, the second pitch of the previous prime form. And, and then he does the same thing with the, he does a separate table for the inversions lined up that way. He then replaces all of those notes in those matrices with the order numbers, not the pitch class numbers, but the order numbers in the original row form, reads diagonally to come up with uh, his system of, we're going to systematize dynamic levels, 12 different dynamic levels going across one diagonal. Uh, going across another diagonal, we had two duplications, so we come up with 10 different articulations. And then piano one is going to perform all 12 prime forms, followed by all 12 
retrograde inversions, while Piano 2 does all 12 inversions, followed by all 12 retrogrades, with serialized you know, dynamics, serialized articulations, serialized durations, all of these things. And, and so everything is, is controlled somehow by the, by the row, by the serialism there. All right. Um, different composers have done different things with, uh, with serialism. Just to mention some others, Luigi Nono did a neat piece, uh, El Canto Sospeso, where he does a wedge row, and his durations are based on the Fibonacci sequence. And, and so 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and then he goes backwards 13, 8, 5, 3, 2, 1. And so his durations are based on the Fibonacci sequence. It's questionable how much of this pre-compositional things you actually hear, in as much as we're not good at picking up all these com complex things with our ears. Um, there's been a you know, big debate about how much ear training can be successfully accomplished during uh, with all of the serialism stuff. 1958, Milton Babbitt, one of the things he's most famous for is this little essay he writes, Who Cares If You Listen?, in which he argues that just as the general public is no longer able to comprehend the things that the mathematicians and the scientists at the universities are doing, why should we expect them to be able to understand what the music professors, what the composition professors at the universities are doing? And so he's like, it doesn't matter if the audiences understand what we're doing. It doesn't matter if the music is too difficult for performers to play. And so... I've got tenure and I'm getting paid anyway, right? <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Um, but we've seen neat things happen with serialism. While the, the hardcore integral serialism doesn't seem to have taken off as much as Babbitt hoped it would, as it turns out, many of us do care if people listen to us anyway. But serial techniques are interesting and, and there are so many things you can do with the concept of retrogrades and inversions you know our next series we're going to see what Stravinsky does with this he does something different we've already we started off our discussion by looking at how John Taverner used some serial techniques in his uh, very approachable piece the lamb and so serialism 